Thank you. Welcome back to the Waiting Native Chronicles. In this video we're going to look into solving gun problems. Guns usually work pretty flawlessly, but there can be times when you get hit with a problem. Like, as the title of this video suggests, you might have a rifle that periodically uh, you have a misfire in it. You pull the trigger and nothing happens. Yeah. Or you might have a rifle that uh, the cases separate inside the chamber and then you're kind of stuck. So don't know what to do you maybe you've handed that ammunition to your buddy and he tries it in his rifle it works fine things like that and uh, so you're left in a quandary as to how to fix your rifle whether it can be fixed uh, you don't really want to go to a gunsmith because they're costly and actually in some areas uh, there's hardly any of them around I know where I live uh, with the oil patch industry all the gunsmiths are working in the oil patch so you we're pretty much left to fixing stuff on our own. As a result, what you end up doing is you have to ask people, uh, whether it's on the internet or going to the gun range or a gun shop or, or whatever, and you're going to wind up with a lot of suggestions and uh, a lot of people talking like they, they're pretty sure they know what solution to your problem is, but really you've got a lot of uh, possible things that uh, it could be and uh, you don't know which one is the right one. So. Who knows what they're talking about, right? So you wind up trying one thing, and you try another thing, and another and another. It starts to get a little bit costly, right? Maybe in the end, you finally give up after spending a lot of money on trying to get the gun fixed and you sell it and it becomes somebody else's problem. That could be a very difficult situation and I would like to offer a better path towards dealing with this. The best way is to acquire a really good understanding of how a rifle functions and not only how the rifle functions but exactly what is going on when you put a, a round in the chamber of your rifle and that firing pin strikes the primer. What is actually happening? This may seem like, uh, like a, there's really not much to it. It just goes boom, right? But there is actually a lot to do. Uh, with that and uh, quite a bit that if you know the details of it will help guide you towards solutions in a lot of different circumstances. Your brain is your best resource. So I want to provide you in this video with a bedrock understanding by going into sort of a deep dive into the subject of headspace. That's uh, one of the issues that afflicts a lot of uh, gun owners that are experiencing problems. But the problem with headspace is that it's kind of hard to get your, your head around. Uh, uh, part of the reason for the difficulty is that headspace means different things with different cartridges. So if you're prepared to spend a few minutes watching this video, I think you'll walk away with something of value to you. And of course, if you get something good out of it, I'd really appreciate you clicking like and subscribe to this channel. So let's get going. What kind of problem is it that we're trying to deal with in this video? I think it's best summed up by looking at your answers to the following questions. Do you have a rifle that it's hard to close bolt on? Do your cartridges sometimes fail to fire? Do you have a rifle for which the bolt does close easily but on occasion the cases separate inside the chamber, so you're just pulling the head out and leaving the rest of the case inside. For those who reload ammunition, you have a rifle that tends to split the cases just ahead of the case head frequently, so that your cases don't last very long. These are common symptoms of uh, what is known as a headspace problem. Headspace problem is kind of hard to get your head around because um, Headspace can mean different things depending on what kind of cartridge you're using, so let me explain this for a little bit. When it comes to headspace, 
cartridges fall into two main categories. There are more, but we'll keep it simple here. The two main categories are ball neck cartridges and straight wall cartridges. So your straight wall is going to be like your 44 Magnum, 45, 70, stuff like that. Your ball neck cartridges are just like this name suggests, they taper to a ball neck. Uh, but not all ball neck cartridges fall into the same category. For the purposes of this video, what we're going to be dealing with are the rimless ball neck cartridges. So that excludes cases like the 3030. The 3030 actually has a rim that protrudes over the bottom of the case and that rim when you push the cartridge ahead into the chamber it's that rim sticking out that will stop the forward movement of the cartridge so it's actually head spacing on the rim they say. Uh, what we're going to deal with are rimless ball neck cartridges. There are still two types of uh, rimless ball neck cartridges too. Uh, there are belted magnums, but we're not going to be dealing with those either in this video. What we're going to deal with are the most common ones, the uh, rimless ball neck cartridges like the 30 odd 6, you got your 270, your 308, your 243, 6.5 Creedmoor, cartridges like that. So they have a rim that doesn't stick out the side like a 3030, and they have a ball neck on them. To understand what headspace is and how it's supposed to work, we have to digress for a minute and see what's going on when a ball neck cartridge is fired in the case. Consideration number one, we have to understand one of the basic challenges when it comes to uh, uh, designing cartridges for, for rifles, and that is that the cartridge cannot be made to the exact inside diameter of the chamber that you're going to put it into. A cartridge has to have a little bit of slop. Uh, it's uh, not a perfect fit because if it was a perfect fit you would have to get that cartridge lined up to be just exactly in line with the bore to get it into the chamber and that would make it very difficult to chamber a cartridge like that so you need to have a little bit of slop now there are cases uh, in, with military rifles and uh, semi-automatics where they'll even increase that amount of slop because uh, they're working in dirty environments and uh, they need uh, to be able to operate that firearm under very stressful conditions. Uh, even in hunting it's the same sort of thing too. You can be working in very <laughs> dirty conditions and uh, it's really important to be able to chamber that next round. So you want to have a little bit of give, some slop, that cartridge is going to go into the chamber rattling around into it a little bit. Consideration number two is we're going to put this loose fitting cartridge into a chamber and then strike it with the firing pin to detonate the primer which is going to result in the gunpowder burning at a very very fast rate like an explosion but it's not really an explosion when those gases are generated the idea is for the gases to propel that bullet down the bore of your barrel but you want those gases to all go down the barrel and you don't want them to seep along the sides of your cartridge and back at the shooter. So as a result of that, that cartridge has to perfectly seal the chamber. Now we're talking about the same cartridge that went into the chamber loosely so you can get it in and out. This is why we use brass for making cases. Brass has two very useful properties when it comes to making ammunition. First of all, brass is very malleable. That means it kind of flows under pressure. And because it's malleable, when the pressure is created inside the case, it's able to change the dimensions of the case. The brass will expand, and that's going to expand right out to the inner surface of your chamber and create a tight seal so that the gases that are pushing the bullet down the barrel will not be able to escape along the sides of the case and get back to the shooter. Secondly, the brass also has a springiness property to it. By that I mean it can rebound after that initial pressure. So the pressure of the gases that seals the chamber, after the pressure is gone, brass will rebound just a little bit and make it loose again. If it didn't do that, you'd have real difficulty getting that case out of the chamber after the round was fired. 
So now, with that out of the way, let's take a deep look at what's going on inside the chamber of your rifle when the firing pin strikes the primer. It's not just a matter of a big bang and that's it. There are a number of discrete steps that occur when a cartridge is being ignited. And these are important to understand for your ability to troubleshoot and know what's going on with your rifle. Without understanding these steps, you will not be able to understand why headspace is important. First of all, remember what I said about the cartridge needing to fit in the chamber somewhat loosely. What I'm going to show you next is a couple of pictures of cartridges that are placed into the chamber of your rifle. In the top picture, you'll see a cartridge that when pushed into the chamber by the bolt behind it, fills out the entire chamber lengthwise completely so that the shoulder of that cartridge is placed right against the inside shoulder of the chamber and the base of the cartridge is right against the bolt face of the rifle. So it fills out that space perfectly. If that cartridge in the top picture was any longer at all, it would have difficulty fitting into the chamber because the bolt wouldn't be able to close behind it. You know, a bolt has uh, camming lugs on it, so you can kind of uh, you can exert a little bit of pressure on the cartridge, and if it's tight fit, you can leverage it ahead by a certain amount, but you don't want to overdo that. That'll put stress on your on your uh, case. So. Uh, case has to fit inside that chamber to a pretty precise amount. If it's too long then you're going to have trouble closing the bolt on your rifle. That distance from the shoulder to the base of the case where it meets the bolt face, that is the headspace of your firearm. When you can't close the bolt on your rifle to when you chamber a cartridge, or if you have great difficulty closing the bolt, then you have a headspace problem that requires you to bump the shoulder of that case back a little. Having said that about the difficulty closing the bolt, there are two other possible causes of it that I should mention briefly. One of them is that the uh, bullet could be seated out a little too far in the case so that the bullet begins to engage the rifling of your barrel before the bolt is fully moved forward and closed. Another possible cause of the bolt being difficult to close that most often happens to reloaders actually is having a case that has an overall length that is too long. See when uh, you reuse cases they grow slightly with each firing because as I mentioned, brass is malleable and it actually flows under pressure so that pre repeated pressure on the case will cause the brass to flow forward where there's room to go and that forward movement will make the neck of the cartridge start to stick out a little further each time and once that length of the cartridge gets to a certain point it will actually, the, the mouth of the cartridge of the case will come into contact with the end of the space that's cut into your chamber. So then you have difficulty closing your bolt for a reason like that. Reloaders generally will trim their cases every third or fourth firing to be sure that that doesn't happen. Because if you do let a case get too long and the mouth will get pinched when you close the bolt on that cartridge, and that pinching of the case mouth as it's trying to squeeze into that, that space, basically trying to squeeze it into the bore of the barrel instead of the chamber, that will cause the mouth of the case to pinch the bullet. And when you pinch the bullet tighter, that's going to create increased pressures. And of course, that can result in some serious problems. So you have to trim your cases occasionally if you're a reloader. Keep in mind when you're looking at these exaggerated figures that I'm putting up here that 
the uh, tolerances are very close when it comes to rifles so it doesn't take very much for things to change and to cause a problem or not have a problem. In fact the manufacturers can only make them so close as well. So you're going to find that some rifles will have a slight difference in the dimensions of their chambers, one rifle to another. This occurs even though the rifle of one manufacturer has been made to fire the exact same cartridge as the rifle of another manufacturer. In fact, it will happen even with rifles made by the same manufacturers. Two rifles coming off the line one after another. So every rifle to some extent is unique. We're dealing with very small tolerances here. So the dimensions shown on these figures are exaggerated. It doesn't take very much to make a difference. So having said that about the differences from one rifle to another, even among those are, that are designed to shoot the same cartridge, the goal of reloaders is to uh, create cartridges that are perfectly fit to a particular rifle, as a rule. Uh, so a reloader will strive to have the headspace, that distance from the shoulder of the, of the case to the bolt face, be exact as a fit goes to the rifle that they're going to shoot it out of. That also means that those reloads that they make may not function well in another gun. It may be hard to close the bolt on the cartridge uh, made for one gun versus another. To go a little deeper, you know, when it comes to these differences in uh, manufacturing tolerances, uh, something else has to be kept in mind because if you're an ammunition manufacturer, you want your ammunition to be useful in all the guns that are out there. And uh, there is going to be a certain amount of variability in the rifles out there that use that ammunition. So if you're a manufacturer of ammunition, you don't want to have uh, customers uh, complaining that uh, your ammunition doesn't work in their guns because that uh, consumer has a rifle that is made with a chamber on the smaller side of that range of variability. So what do you do as a ammunition manufacturer? You make your ammunition to fit the worst case scenario, right? The, uh, it's got to fit into the smallest chambers that are produced by rifle makers. So. What that's going to result in is a uh, cartridge that's going to fit a little bit loose if your rifle is not one of those worst case scenarios. So that's uh, one of the things that reloaders really solve when they make their own ammunition, especially if they are adjusting that headspace of the cases that they're using. And I'll get into that a little bit more later. When the distance from the shoulder to the base of the case is too short compared to the headspace of the rifle, what's going to happen when you fire the case, uh, the cartridge, is that the case is going to have to stretch to fill out that inside space. And what that results in is frequently that you will have the case separating at some point inside the chamber. And that could result in you pulling out just the head and leaving the rest of the case inside your chamber when you operate the bolt to cycle the next round. To get a grasp of why case heads may separate in the brass that you're shooting, you have to get a good sense of what is happening inside the chamber when the firing pin strikes the primer. So this is where we're going to dive a little bit deep and I'll use a few illustrations to try to make this clear. To begin with, the cartridge is cycled into the chamber by the bolt pushing it from behind. So once it's in the chamber, the base of the cartridge is flat against the bolt face, right? Now, if the head space of the chamber is a little too long, then we're going to have a bit of space in front of that shoulder where it's not in contact with the inside shoulder of the chamber. So now we have this case sitting inside the chamber, and it is right now against, right against the bolt face, but there's a little bit of room ahead before it uh, will contact the shoulder of the chamber on the inside. The firing pin is released, it strikes the primer, and what's going to happen? Well, it's kind of like uh, 
taking a soccer ball because remember what I said that case is going in there loose and rattly there's nothing to hold it back from moving forward or back so when that primer is struck by the firing pin the whole cartridge moves ahead until the shoulder of the case contacts the shoulder of the chamber on the inside and then things come to a stop so it's kind of uh, reducing the impact force of the firing pin on the primer and that can easily result in the primer not detonating or if it does detonate it may be a case of the rifle not detonating reliably so maybe every tenth shot or something like that just uh, doesn't go off and that can be very frustrating and really reduce your confidence in the rifle that you need to function when everything's on the line for you. But let's just say that the cartridge did move ahead a little bit when the firing pin struck the primer and uh, the primer did detonate anyways. What happens then? Well the primer is now detonating and it's caused the gunpowder to start burning and that burning gunpowder is going to create gas at a very fast rate and that gas has to go somewhere so what exactly happens when that gas starts to be created and the pressures increase they spike very rapidly what happens next is something that even reloaders fail to properly appreciate because they don't realize how important it is for the case to grip the inside walls of the chamber because what happens when the gunpowder starts to burn is the pressure builds and that pressure is exerted forward down the barrel it's forward exerted rearward towards the bolt face and it's exerted perpendicularly it's exerted in every direction and it's going to uh, deform or cause movement in the weakest part of the system now of course one of those Weak parts is the bullet, so it'll start moving ahead, but it's not moving ahead fast enough. It's a heavy bullet. So the pressure is building inside that case, and the next thing that's going to start to give is the diameter of the case. It's going to increase, and that's exactly what we want it to do. We want it to increase because it's going to seal tightly against the inside diameter of the chamber. Remember, it first went in there loose, but now it's a tight, tight fit. And that tight fit will prevent that portion of the case, or the whole case, from moving rearward, actually. Unless you're a reloader who thinks you don't have to remove resizing fluid. And I do have a special video just on that subject. So I'll link that at the end of this video, if you're interested. But anyway, so that... Uh, that cartridge is now the case is now gripping the inside of the chamber so that it can't move back the bullet is moving ahead down the bore and there's only one area left with some give if you have a, a headspace problem in your rifle and that is the head of the case the part that should be in contact with the the bolt face but it's actually a little ways away from it because the chamber of your rifle is a little too long for the cartridge so what's going to happen is that bolt that that case head is going to move backwards until it comes into contact with the bolt face now that uh, movement is going to there's going to have to be some stretch to let that case head move back and contact the bolt face and the stretch is not going to happen in that thick part of the case head there's a whole lot of brass there uh, if you look at a cross section of uh, of a case you'll see that there's thick brass there where the case is thin is just right after that web in the case head and then it becomes thin case walls so there's just a uh, all there's a very localized amount of stretching that's going to occur as that head of the case moves back until it is stopped by the bolt face so guess where it's going to fail. All that stretching occurs in that very small region and that's why typically when you have a headspace problem in a rifle, a 
headspace problem being too long for your, your cases, that your split is going to occur just ahead of the thick portion of your case head. It happens all the time. It may not happen the very first firing, but that is all that f stretching and uh, working of the brass is occurring in a very small region. So if it doesn't separate on the first time, it might separate on the second time. And that's a, a great cause of premature case failure or case head separation. As a little side note, if you uh, find your cases to be very sooty after you shoot them, if you're someone who reloads ammunition, this happens quite a bit to uh, those who shoot uh, straight walled uh, ammunition like 44 mag, that type of thing. If your cases come out very sooty, keep in mind what we were just talking about, how the case swells to fill out the inside of the chamber and that creates that seal. You need to have enough pressure in order to do that. So if your cases do come out of your rifle or your handgun, whatever, and they're all black all the time, you're wondering what's going on, that's because you don't have enough pressure and your loads are a little too light. You should actually increase them a bit. And uh, once you increase them, you'll get a tighter seal and you're, you won't get any more of that blow-by because that blow-by is not a good thing. It's hard on the gun and it can be hard on you as well. Having a case head separate while you're on a hunt or in a competition or something like that can really ruin your day. So if you suspect that you may be having uh, headspace problems in your gun, one way to check it is get yourself uh, a paper clip, some kind of springy wire. This is a bit of too long of a bend on the end, but bend it on the end a little like that and stick it into the mouth of the case and then stroke the inside of the case wall near the head. And if you have this tip here nice and sharp, if you are having the first symptoms of uh, case head separation due to a headspace problem, that little paper clip is going to catch on a little valley that's starting to be created in the inside wall of your case. That's giving you a little heads up that head separation is about to occur. So that's something you can try. And as a side note, if you do happen to have a case head separation in the field, uh, one possible way of clearing it is to put a brass cleaning brush into your chamber, oversize, and then pull it back. You may be able to get that case out that way but uh, not guaranteed. It's a good reason for taking a cleaning kit in the field with you though. So to wrap up, if you are having a problem with uh, cartridges not firing reliably in your rifle or if you're having a lot of case head separations uh, due to a head space, what are the solutions that are open to you? Well, it kind of depends a little bit on what your situation is. If you don't reload your own ammunition, you've either got to take your rifle to a gunsmith and have the headspace adjusted. It's something that can be done. It'll cost you a few bucks. Or you can have somebody who is a reloader. Maybe they can tailor make some ammunition for you. On the other hand, if you are a reloader and you can make your own ammunition, then it's uh, time to start adjusting those reloading dies. It is possible to uh, take the uh, cases you fired once and adjust your die so that it either doesn't move the shoulder down at all when you resize the case, or if it does move the shoulder down, it moves it down just a little bit. Because in most cases when you have a headspace problem, the case is not going to fail on the very first fire. So after you've fired a case, uh, a cartridge once, uh, maybe it's uh, standard factory ammunition, the firing of that case will cause it to fire form basically to the inside of your chamber. And when you take that case out, it's going to fit the chamber of your rifle just perfectly. Uh, so you can take that case and say, okay, I've got to always resize it so that the diameter <clears throat> is giving me enough play so that I can put the case into the chamber without uh, it uh, being too tight. 
but the overall length I want to keep that the same. That's the distance from the shoulder to the base of the case. And you can uh, definitely adjust your resizing dies when you're a reloader so that it doesn't move that shoulder or move it very much. Now generally for hunters they don't they want to have a little bit of a looser fit because uh, things can be a little more iffy in the field where somebody who's a target shooter or a bench rest shooter they'll tend to just neck size they won't even size the body of the of the case they don't mind it if the cases fit in a little tight and if they're a little bit problematic but when you're hunting you want everything to just rattle in there real easy so uh, that is something that you can do the thing to keep in mind though when you fire form cases like that and uh, custom make the uh, the headspace on your cases custom to the gun that you're shooting them out of is very likely those cases are only going to function well in the gun that you did that for so just keep that in mind that uh, you these cases that are custom dimensioned for your rifles chamber you they may not work in in buddy's rifle or your spouse's rifle so they're particular to the gun you shoot and as a rule that's the best way to do things anyways especially if you're reloading you've tested your your pressure levels and things in that particular gun uh, some rifles have a freer throat in them so you can see the bullet out further than other rifles and all these little changes can make great differences in pressure so you're better off when you reload ammunition to keep that ammunition just for that rifle that you reloaded it for unless you've thoroughly tested it in another rifle and found it to be okay but when you test it then you have to work your loads up from a low charge and, and look for pressure indicators along the way. On the topic of adjusting your reloading dies so that you don't uh, bump the shoulder back further than necessary I might make another video on that at some point down the road if you're interested in uh, learning about that just uh, let me know in the comments and I'll, that'll definitely have some influence on on the matter. So that pretty much covers the topic of uh, headspace and the kind of problems it can cause and uh, the possible solutions to it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy it, please click like on this video and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Your active subscribing and your support uh, is what really keeps things going here. It makes all the difference. So from the way to Native Chronicles, I'd like to wish you God bless and uh, hope to see you next time. If you have any comments or questions, uh, post them in the comments section of this video and I'll uh, do my best to get back to you as soon as I can on that. And uh, well, until next time, God bless. Yeah.